Today, I'm going to be lecturing on option prices. Let me tell you what is going to happen today. In the first two lectures, we've been dealing with situations where cash flows, money, was known in advance. We knew what was going to happen. We had certainty about the future. We knew coupon payments will happen until a maturity date. We knew bonds would be delivered for the forward contracts. Everything was known for sure. Today, that's going to change. What is going to happen today, what's going to define our discussion today is that we're going to start to introduce the concept of randomness, the concept of um, 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 stochastic cash flows, cash flows that would happen with certain probabilities. That is what we're doing today. The surprise the surprise will be by the end of today or by next week, we will realize that we will be able to deal with uncertainty in exactly the same way as we dealt with certainty. Uh, this is what arbitrage free pricing will do for us. And it is a surprise, you will see. It, it, it's, it's a very, that surprise is going to happen in the first uh, uh, 10 minutes of today, but it's going to extend very far and wide. And this is one of the reasons why option pricing, derivative pricing, derivative trading, hedging, all of those things, that's why mathematics becomes so relevant in those theories because what seemed to be random will not be. Okay, so that uh, is going to come up in, in, in different uh, situations over and over again. We're going to get almost sick and tired of the same argument until we get it right in different situations. But that's what's going to happen. That's the announcement. That's the spoiler for what's going to happen today. What seemed like random will not be. But let me be very specific. What does that mean? This is what we're going to be doing. We're going to start with an example. This example, I want to spend a lot of time on this example. Why? Because this example is going to be a very good explanation of what's to follow for the next weeks. I will keep on using that example over and over and over again. And for that reason, we're going to develop this example very well with a lot of care. Once we have that, we're going to start to define um, mathematical objects that will help us understand what we did. Okay, so these are the mathematical constructions we will do today to understand what derivative trading is. We're going to introduce the concept of implied probabilities, and that will um, lead us to a discussion of markets, how markets work, and that will lead us into pricing theory. How does pricing of securities Work. And these are, will be now securities with stochastic cash flows, not deterministic cash flows. Okay, that is what we're doing today. We are going to be dealing with the world of um, randomness. And to, de to deal with the world of randomness, I am going to start with uh, my example. The, the basic example, which is what will dictate what we do. So let's 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 look at this before i start this example that i have on the screen i'm going to give you a very similar example you can look at the screen or not if you want to my example has nothing to do with the screen okay and i would like to have a volunteer to play a little game with me okay if the volunteer is there i would suggest that you come up raise your hand do something and the game I want to play with the volunteers is the following. I'm going to uh, flip a coin. And if heads shows, I will give you a dollar. And if tails shows, I give you nothing. So you have nothing to lose, okay? If a head shows, I give you a dollar. 50% probability, I give you a dollar. If tail shows, I give you... Um, nothing okay so anybody's willing to play with me you play sebastian will play with me very good yeah good okay so um you're not gonna you're gonna you're not gonna play for free right 
you have a chance of making money and there's no downside. So my question to you would be how much would you pay to play this game? Remember, we're going to be for a few weeks, we're going to be uh, working for free. I mentioned that last week. I'll mention it again today. I'll mention it again next week. So for a while, we're going to be uh, working for free. We're not looking to make a profit yet. We'll be looking to make it make profits in the last three weeks of this course. But until then, we we'll work for free. How much would you pay to play this game? Well, if it's free, then I mean, I I would pay zero. I would do it for free. You you will pay zero. Then I'm not playing with you. Because if, if there's a 50% okay. chance I will give you a dollar and there's a 50% chance I give you nothing, I am not going to play for free. So thank you very much for volunteering to play with me, but that's not going to work. You understand? <laughs> yeah, this is how markets work, right? Uh, you want to you want me to give you something for free, I'm not going to do it. So do you have a better offer? Is someone um, else in the classroom who's going to play with a better offer? Uh... I guess I'll offer you 50 cents or 40, well, 49 yeah. cents. Okay, so someone offers me 49 cents. Anybody um, has a better offer? 50 cents. 50 cents. Who yeah, said 50, 50 cents? cents? I I cannot see. Me. Okay, so you, you said 50 cents. Okay, so for 50 cents, I will play. Right? For 50 cents, I will play. And you will probably play. Why? Because, again, we are in a world where we work for free. Yes? 50 cents. Okay, so that's fine. 50 cents. And maybe the first time we, I mean, the first time we, we play, well, someone's going to make, someone's going to lose, right? You pay 50 cents. If head shows, I lose 50 cents. You make 50 cents. If tail shows, then I'm the one making 50 cents. You lose 50 cents. Every time we play, they say winner and a loser. Over time, that we think that's going to balance out by the law of large numbers. And over time, if we play this many, many times, what will happen? If what will happen is that on average, you will end up breaking even and I will end up in breaking even. And because everybody's working for free, we will both be quite happy. Is that correct? We understand that? Yes, everybody understands that. I mean, this is the, I mean, this is the simplest probability game you've ever played. You've, you've been, this is the probability that you did the first time you saw probability probably in high school. That's my guess. Yes? Okay. So I have um, Sebastian and I have Chi here. Okay, good. Um, let me play. It seems like the same game. Let's, but let me explain this game. And now you can look at the screen. Okay, but only look at the, you don't have to read what's, what's, what's there. Um, I have a certain asset. It could be my house, it could be my car, it could be a stock, it could be a, a book, it could be a baseball card. I have an asset. The asset is worth one dollar. Okay? And then this asset will r rise in price to two dollars with 50% chance. So you, you flip your coin. Okay, the same coin as before, and with a 50% chance, this asset will go up in price to $2. With a 50% chance, this asset will go down in price to $0.50. Cents. The same coin as before will dictate the evolution of the price of this asset. Okay? And now, we're going to play the same game. Except in this case, we're going to state the game a little bit differently. I want to, the words, the English statement is going to be different i will say i'm not going to say if i flip my coin you get a dollar if head search what i want to say is that if the asset price goes from a dollar to two goes up if the asset price goes up i give you a dollar if the asset price goes down i give you nothing looks like the same game as before it's the same coin yes How much are you willing to pay to play this game? Anybody? Excuse me, Professor. I've got yes. a question. Yes. I need everybody so, to understand the game. Okay. 
as said, it, there's there's are also fifty percent of the probability that my asset will decrease to zero point five. Yes, fifty percent is the same so point as before. The coin, coin can not, yes, in this in this second version of the game, is the same coin as before. The coin will determine the evolution of the price of my asset. Okay. It's 50 50, same as before. For a dollar, go to two. I mean, I, I could pick different numbers three, five, doesn't matter. Okay, one, two and a half are numbers that work. They're very good, right? Um, so it's the same as same, same, same coin as before, but there's an asset, an asset in the middle. As you will see, the asset will change everything. But for now, let's ignore that, right? You understand it's the same game as before, sure. except it's expressed differently. I'm not saying that if a dollar, sorry, I'm not saying every head shows I give you a dollar. I say if the asset goes from a dollar to two, I give you a dollar. If it goes from a dollar to 50 cents, I give you nothing. And then I'm asking how much are you willing to pay to play this game? It looks like we're doing philosophy, but we're not. Okay, we're doing finance. You will see. You will see. All right, so how much are you willing to pay to play this game anybody sebastian chi anybody vincent anybody who how much are you going to let's do an auction how much are you willing to pay you can look at this uh, graph now here that's that's the question how much are you going to pay that's the question you get a dollar if it goes up, you get nothing if it goes down. So someone said 50 cents. Someone, some, someone is offering me 50 cents. I take it. I take it. Okay. I don't know who said 50 cents. It's in the chat. I I don't want to click into the chat now. But someone is, someone is willing to pay 50 cents to play this game. This is great. Let me show you what will happen. I'll take it. Okay. I accept your 50 cents. So someone gives me 50 cents to play this game 50 cents i have that this is what i'm going to do watch i'm going to borrow i'm going to borrow so this is what you pay i have that in my pocket right i'm going to borrow for example 30 cents and now i take my 80 cents and I'm going to buy 80% of the stock and I wait for the coin flip if the stock goes up in price my 80% of the stock is worth 1.6 so I give you a dollar and I collect 60 cents as profit I have to return 30 cents that I borrowed, so my profit turns into 30 cents. Are you following? The 1.6 is the $1 I pay you, plus my loan, plus 30 cents profit. That's profit. That's profit. What happens if the asset goes down in price? My 80 cents become 40 cents. 40 cents becomes zero that I pay you, plus the 30 cents I have to return as my loan, plus 10 cents profit. Profit. Are you, are you, are you following this? What's happening here? What's happening here? Every time we play, I make money. Why? Because I'm willing to pay 50 cents to play the game. Yeah, you're paying too much. 
That's the only logical conclusion. You're paying too much. This didn't happen when I was simply flipping a coin. The fact that I have an asset with these prices means that you're paying too much. So it looked like it was the same game, but it's not the same game. It's a different game. We're going to understand this very, very well by the end of today and especially by the end of next week. Hmm? And this is going to have lots of consequences. We just found an arbitrage opportunity. It seems that if you pay 50 cents, then this price is too high. Okay. So what is the right price? That's my next question then. So this doesn't work. I'm going to remove all of this. Everybody understands what's written here on the screen? Everybody understands? What if you pay a different number? Let's say that I, I want to delete all of this. What happens if you pay 40 cents? What will happen if you pay 40 cents? If you pay 40 cents, I'm going to borrow 10 cents. And I buy 50% of the stock. If the stock goes up, that becomes, um, sorry, I need to borrow a little bit more, 20, 20 cents, I made a mistake, okay, I was rushing. The stock goes up, it's $1.2, I give you your dollar, and I collect 20 cents, which means I return the loan, I don't make any money. So that's starting to look good, right? You see, if the stock goes up, my profit is zero profit. But if the stock goes down, my 60 cents become 30 cents. I return my 20 cents loan and I have a 10 cent profit. So I have a profit. I don't have a profit if the stock goes up, but I have a profit if the stock goes down. Still, it's an arbitrage opportunity. I don't lose money and there's a probability I make money. That's another example of arbitrage. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that 40 cents is also too much. That's what it's going to mean. And we can resolve this in two ways. We can resolve this by continuing to run this auction and perhaps having lower and lower prices until we find the equilibrium. Or we can realize what's going on. We can realize what's going on and realize that there is the exact price that makes this game profit-free, okay? Remember, profit-free, we work for free. This is the uh, mantra we're gonna be having for, for a while. Okay, good. So uh, what is the, uh, the solution? Anybody, I'm gonna see there's a lot of notations in the chat. Um, the 20, Five cents. Someone is saying twenty-five cents. Um, for twenty-five cents, I'm not playing. I happen to know what I'm lecturing about, and I know that twenty-five cents is too little. I will always lose money. Okay. So, what's the right price? Anybody knows? Let me give you the answer. It's the actually the actually, actually the answer is um, I, I'll come back to this slide in a, in a minute. Okay. The actual answer is in the next slide. Um, the actual price is one third of a dollar. That's the answer, one third of a dollar. Why? Because this is what I'm going to do. This is a replicating portfolio. It's a replicating portfolio similar to the one we built last week to replicate a bond forward contract. But now we're doing it, we're not doing a bond forward contract. We're doing it, this will be an option. I will explain this later, okay? Um, we are going to do a replicating portfolio that will replicate this random game. It seems like a random game. We're about to realize it's not a random game. So this is what I'm going to do. This is my portfolio. I'm going to borrow one third of a dollar. You paid one third of a dollar. That's two thirds of a dollar that now I have in my possession, which I use to buy two thirds of the stock. Hmm? What happens when I buy two thirds, do you understand? I borrowed a third and I bought two thirds of the stock. Let me go back 
to the previous page and see what happens if I get one third of a dollar and I buy two thirds of the stock. Okay, I paid one third. I borrowed one third. The two thirds, if the stock goes up, is four thirds. Four thirds is the one I give you plus the one third I borrowed that I have to return plus zero profit. If the stock goes down, the two thirds becomes one third, which is the zero I had to pay you, the one third I have to return as my loan and zero profit. Aha. One third is the profit less price, is the price that leads to no profit. So, what's the answer? A third of a dollar. That's the price of this game, so to speak. Is that clear? Is that clear to everybody? The price is one third of a dollar? Any price above that will lead to an arbitrage opportunity in the sense that I will always make money. Any price below that will lead to an arbitrage opportunity, which is where you always make money. Now, this is, it, it, it is this understood? This should be an epiphany. This should be a, dis a big discovery. In fact, this was a big discovery when it happened. Steve Ross was one of the people who was involved in this. The fact that I have a replicating portfolio, which is I take your, your third of a dollar, I borrow money, I buy the stock, and then I have exactly enough money to pay you back. This has tremendous consequences. First of all, the first consequence, it, it shows us that this game is not random. It's, it seems that it's random, but it's not, you see? I don't have to wait for the coin flip to know what my cash flows are going to be. So given what we learned last week, now we're moving ahead. If it's not random, then everything we did last week should work. Everything we've learned about fixed income is probably going to be useful in this context too because this is not random it's but something is not right this looks very random to me doesn't it what's happened to the randomness that is what we're going to be learning today that is what we're going to be learning today This, this game is going to be a, a source of inspiration and actually a very good guiding help for us as we develop more and more concepts in finance. That's why it has to be very well understood. Let me express this game differently now. Are you all with me? I hope you're all with me. Okay there's a way to express this game differently. And now I'm going back to my first slide and I'm doing my first slide slightly differently. And now I'm going to read through the English as it was written here. I'm going to give you a financial instrument that has a certain payoff equal to the price of a stock, which is here, minus one dollar at a future point in time but the price will never be negative in other words this is the option not the obligation the option to buy the stock for a dollar you see that it's expressed mathematically with this notation here the sub plus notation means that I take this value only when it's positive, not when it's negative. That's what that means. In other words, you have the option, not the obligation to buy the stock. Um, to explain this a little bit better, let me assume what will happen if I drop that, if I remove that plus sign from there, what happens? This is a forward contract, this is a futures contract. That's what we saw last week, where if the stock is lower you still have to buy it for a dollar you are committed 
That's a futures contract or a forward contract. Remember? By adding this plus sign, what we are doing is we're turning the commitment into an option. That's what these instruments are called options. That's what these derivatives are called options. By the way, uh, forwards and futures are also derivatives. Okay, I'm not too interested in vocabulary right now. I want you to understand the difference between a forward and a future. So between the futures and an option, they're very similar, except we remove the obligation. That's where the futures are free and the options are not. You have to pay. Um, Sebastian was offering to play this for free, and I said no. In a futures contract, I would have said yes. In an options contract, I don't play for free. Why? Because you have the option. You can always walk away, and then I'm stuck, right? I, I then I'm losing. So. You understand the, the significance of this? Okay, let me explain this in yet a different way. I want to be with this slide a little, a few more minutes, okay? I need you to understand something else related to this. There's another way of expressing what this is. And for that, let me, let me do a bit of a role playing game here, okay? Imagine, I, I'm, I'm the owner of a big corporation, I'm Mark Zuckerberg, okay? Or Steve Jobs when he lived or something like that. And then I wanna hire the CEO of that company. I wanna hire a CEO for Facebook. Anybody, any one of you wants to be the CEO of Facebook? No one wants to be yeah, the CEO. Sure. I, I, can, I can take, I can take, take that You can take that job. Only one person out of 100 wants to take that job. I, I don't predict a very good professional future for any of you if you're not willing to take that offer. Okay. Okay. So you take that offer. Let me ask you a question. How much shall I pay you to be the CEO of Facebook? How much do you want to be paid? What's your asking price? I think I think the average salary on the market. The average, really? That's what you would do? Well, I mean, like you're, the average salary. You are you're, you're so cheap. I feel tempted not to hire you. <laughs> that is not how executives are paid. How are executives paid? That that's the right answer. If you're going to get a programming job or something, right? If you're going to get see. The CEO of the company. What is the CEO? Of, what is the what is the main job of the CEO of a company? What's the main job? Uh, as written, on the, said, as written on the textbooks. Okay, it's not that I agree with that definition, but if you read the textbooks, they would say that the CEO job is to to maximize shareholder value. That's what they say. In other words, the job of the CEO is to make the share price as high as possible, right? Because of that, most most CEOs are hired not with money, but with options as you have here in front of you. In other words, I figure out a certain price, what I hear called $1 is called a strike price, which could be the price of the stock now. Okay, if I hire you as a CEO now, I would say, well, look, if you make this company worth, if you make this company be worth, you know, a few billion more, I'll give you a piece of that. How's that? But of course, if the company goes down in value, I'm not going to ask you for money that, you know, I cannot do that, right? This is how executive compensation works. This is how executives are paid. Yes, you will have a nominal salary. Sometimes that salary is a dollar. Sometimes that salary, I mean, Elon Musk had a salary of a dollar for a long time. Sometimes that that salary could be a hundred thousand, one hundred and fifty, a small amount, very small amount for it. Okay, where a lot of the, it could be five million dollars. Still, for many executives, their big payment happens on their stock options package as which is exactly is exactly what you have in front of you is exactly what we have here of course the one dollar changes the value is the valuation of the company is not one or two dollars is something else 
but the concept is exactly the same. This is how this is how management is compensated in 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 companies. Right? You get a piece of that. You get a piece of that. Uh, you understand? So call options, they are actually, they actually that's how they started, okay? Um, on, the, on the website you have the, the uh, Nobel lecture given by Myron Scholes, happens to be Canadian from Timmins, Ontario, in which he explains the history of how he developed what, what, what is called, what's called the Black Scholes Merton theory, which we will see here in, in a few weeks. And there, uh, in, in, in his case, uh, he, his discovery was on how to price options. But the question that was given to him, I think it was by Wells Fargo, it was a consulting agreement that he did for Wells Fargo, was in the context of employee compensation packages. Why? Because before people knew what you have in front of you, if, if, if you hire, say, a CEO or you hire, you know, and management and you pay them with options you need to account for the value of those options right and that was a very difficult job because you have to account for the accounting value of cash flows which are stochastic you don't know what those future values are going to be you see back to the problem at hand which is how do you price randomness lecture one was how to price time now the focus has changed to how to price randomness and what we just learned through our simple example is that randomness is actually not random it's also deterministic there is a way to price these derivatives these options these random payoffs and that was a big discovery and of course that gave rise to you know, a few Nobel Prize prices given to people, and that is what we're going to be, that's what we're going to be dealing with now. Okay, so the thirty-three cent gain could be put in the context of employee compensation packages, but there is already something that tells us that randomness is not so random when it comes to pricing. Okay. I think I give you an example um, on the first day of, the, of, of this course, which I can repeat again. It's something that happened in New York in the 80s. There was a famous case called the Bankers Trust case, which was a little bit as follows. I remind you, we, we spoke about that, but it's important that I bring it up again. Okay? Bankers Trust had a certain derivative trade with uh, Procter & Gamble. Okay? What it was is not relevant for this discussion. It was a derivative um, where if certain things happen in the market, you pay them, and if certain other things happen, you get paid. Okay, very similar to what we're doing with here. And uh, well, uh, the, the derivative was sold way, way above market uh, value, but of course, no one knew what the market value was. Hmm? The shareholder became very, very annoyed, very angry. And then he claimed this derivative trade was gambling because you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So it's gambling. And gambling is illegal in the state of New York. It's legal in Nevada, but it's illegal in New York. By the way, that's where we have the casinos in Ontario, but that's a different story. Hmm? So if it's illegal in New York, then you could sue the New York banks. And believe me, this was not a joke. The, banks in New York when this happened that was at the beginning of the derivatives trading business they were very alarmed because this could signify the end of derivative trading the way the defense happened the way these derivatives were dictated to not be gambling is through an argument very similar to what we're seeing here today in fact you can use the 33 cent game as proof to a judge that this thing that you have in front of you is not gambling. 
you can express this as a roulette if you want to, but the outcome is known. We know what the outcome is going to be. This is not gambling. So the consequences of what we're seeing here are very, very, very deep and very extensive. They led to Nobel Prizes to be given to people. It led to lawsuits being resolved in court and to preserve the derivatives business of New York banks. Do you see all that? Do you see all that? We have just reached the top of this mountain and I want to make sure that we're all together. No one was lost. This was not so hard. I want to make sure we're all together. Is this clear? Everybody's everybody's is good with this. If we're all together, if we all understand this, what I want to do now is what you do every time you climb a mountain, which is you look at the landscape. I want to see what we can see from here. I want to look around and from this vantage point we've developed, I want to see what we've learned. Okay? So I want to start to develop some mathematical objects. I want to try to twist the situation a little bit here. We're going to look around, okay? Maybe not 360 degrees, but maybe at least 270 degrees. We're going to look around to see what we can learn from this thing we just saw, from this mountain we just climbed. Is that okay? All good? All right. This is our argument as to why the price is one third. It should be clear, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the concept of interest rates into our argument because it gives rise to a very nice uh, setup. It's, the, it's exactly the same we just developed, but it's a little bit more robust. In One could have said in a previous example that this thing that I borrow money for free is not realistic. Well, it corresponds to, to interest rates which are not zero. The fact that I borrow 33 cents today to return them tomorrow or next year for exactly the same amount that's unrealistic, it corresponds to zero interest rates. It's not that zero interest rates are not realistic, they are, they've happened. But typically, in most applications, in most markets, interest rates are not zero. So you could argue, so well, what if interest rates are not zero? What happens if I have rates which are positive? This is how the argument changes in that case. If rates are something else, not zero, I'm going to do the same argument. I'm going to construct my replicating portfolio in the following way. I'm not going to talk about borrowing. What I'm going to do is about purchasing a bond. A bond with a notional value of one dollar. A bond that at maturity will give me one dollar. If maturity is next day, if this is a game we play for a day, then that, that will be tomorrow. That's the bond that I have here. And the act of borrowing is going to be short selling bonds. That's what we're going to be doing. You see? So what I'm going to do is look at the same, exactly the same replicating portfolio we built earlier. But I'm going to look at that portfolio and write it like this. I'm going to have a portfolio which consists of two thirds of a stock and minus one third of a bond. Why is that my replicating portfolio? Well, it's my replicating portfolio because that, <laughs> that portfolio uh, has a payoff, which is exactly what my option payoff will be. When the stock goes to $2, I get one dollar, two thirds minus one third is um, uh, one. So two thirds times two minus one third is one. And when the stock goes down, it's zero. So this portfolio has values, future values, stochastic values that match the option values, right? So if the option values in the future match the future values of this replicating portfolio, then the value of the replicated portfolio today has to be equal to the price of the option. 
and that is one third, is right here. And I know, and I know what my replicating portfolio is, which is I buy two thirds of the stock and I borrow one third of the, of the bond. And the difference in price is exactly the price of the option. It's exactly the same thing I did earlier, but now this also works for bonds which are not equal to one dollar for bonds that correspond to interest rates which are bigger than zero. You see that? Okay, so exactly the same argument. If we make it a little bit more financial, a little bit less of a buy, sell, you know, then it becomes a very robust expression of what replicating portfolios are. And this works for all possible interest rates, not only for interest rates which are zero. Okay. So the conclusion here is that the option price will always be equal to this thing we have here, which happens to be that. And this is independent of the probability of my stock goes up or down. It depends on interest rates. It depends on the price of the stock and the price of the bond. It does not depend on the probability that the stock goes up or down. So this is something surprising, don't you think? It, it, it's so surprising, it looks even wrong. Because we just found the price of this option without, without using the probability that the stock goes up or down. So if you have a stock that is very likely to go up in price, therefore, this game seems to have a bigger expected payoff the price is still the same, it doesn't change. This price is independent of the probability that my stock goes up or down. That's, that's what, is that weird? Well, it's a fact, so it's not weird, it's a fact, okay? Some of you may say the following, this is a, a, it's a different way of looking at this, which is, well, if the stock is very likely to go up, right, then interest rates should have a bigger value otherwise why is this stock so cheap or is the stock a dollar if it's so likely to go up to two dollars and this somehow goes back to the concept that we're dealing with here um we are not trying to say that there has to be a direct relationship between the probability of the stock going up or down because these are stochastic events okay uh, what i'm saying is that what is clear from our setting is that the probability of the stock going up or down is irrelevant to us. What is relevant to us are the prices of the stock now and tomorrow. That's it. It's the only thing that we need. Excuse me? Yes. I just have a question. From the perspective of the person buying the option, right? Yeah. The, the option has a price of one third and they get $1 with 50% probability and $0 with 50% probability. Why isn't that arbitrage? Because aren't we, aren't we on average making money? Well, see, let's, let's say that on average you're making money. If you're making money on average, that's still not arbitrage. Arbitrage, as we will see later today or next week, is making money for sure. For sure. Okay? So that's what arbitrage will be. Um, the, see, last week arbitrage was making money. Everything was deterministic. So if you make money, you make money. Right? If you make money with a certain probability and lose money with a certain other probability, that's not arbitrage, independent of how unbalanced that is. So for example, a lottery ticket is not arbitrage. You are most likely to lose. The odds are against you because you know the state is the one who makes all the money. So it's not arbitrage either for you or for them because they have a chance of losing. 
If you have a chance of losing, it's not arbitrage. Arbitrage will always only be when you will never lose. That's a vocabulary issue, and that's the way we're going to def define arbitrage. The fact that you can make a dollar with a probability which is higher than the cost, which is what you're talking about, will not be arbitrage. You have to wait maybe an hour to, un to, to understand the answer to your question a little bit better. We're going to get deeper and deeper and deeper into this, okay? But let me just say that arbitrage is only when you make money for free. If you're taking risks, even if the outcomes are in your favor, that will not be arbitrage. And, as you, and, and for a very good reason. We will see that mathematically arbitrage, as we saw last week, is only making money for free. If you're taking risks, risks are not free. In fact, one of the consequences of what we're doing here is we'll have the ability to find the price of risk. We found the price of time in lecture number one and number two. In these lectures, we're going to find the price of risk. Risk is not free. You don't take risks for free. And a lot of what we're going to be doing uh, in this course, actually all the way to the end, is understand the price of risk. Risk is not free. You don't take risks for free. Because of that, arbitrage is only going to show up when there is no risk. You are not going to lose money. Is, is that clear? At this, at the yeah, philosophical yeah. level, mathematically, you will see this. So, we'll right. develop the theory. So what you're saying is actually the the, the, the the fact that we're we're more likely to make money is actually a necessary consequence. The fact that we're willing to lose money. Yes. It's sort of yes, because the risk is right. really higher. Yes. In fact, let, since you mentioned that, let me bring up some another issue that it was going to come up later, but I'll bring it up now. Okay. Um, what is the risk I'm taking if I buy this option? You can say nothing because I could replicate the portfolio. It is true. It is true. I could replicate the portfolio and the risk is zero. However, from an investment perspective, going back to your question, I put a third of a dollar I could walk away with nothing. I have the risk of losing 100%. I also have the probability of making 300%. You can say, well, the odds are in my favor. I'm not so sure. Right? When you have the chance of, of losing everything, you could say that the risk is very high. Look at the stock. The stock, the worst it's going to do is lose 50%. So there's something very interesting here, and maybe I, again, these are things that will come up in a few weeks, but I'll use this example to point out, to give a very simple mathematical description of something that happened on October 19, 1987. Okay, so look, look at this. Um, imagine you have a stock market that drops. Here, in, you know, my market can drop by 50%. A very big number. What happened that day, October 19, 1987, what happened is that the market dropped 25%. And there were companies that went bankrupt on a 25, there were banks that went bankrupt on a 25% drop. Okay, well, there's several reasons for that. You can say, well, if you have leverage, right, you borrow a lot of money, then of course, if the market drops by 25%, you can lose a lot. That's true. But there's another reason. This leverage was accounted for. It was easy to account for leverage. Okay, and there were companies, and this is how risk management started. Risk management really, financial risk management really started that day. And it happened because of a situation that I can, I can, as a caricature, as a cari what we have in front of us is a caricature of what happened that day. A market that moves 50%, we lose 100%. Why? Because we have derivatives. Derivatives are going to be non-linear instruments. They don't depend linearly on the market. Or at least the, the, the linear factor is not going to be one, right? Um, the stock can go up by 200%. Sorry, the stock can go up by 100% or drop by 50%. The option can go up by 300%. What, sorry, go up by 200% to 300% valuation or drop 100%. 
So risk is maximized in the option as it is in the stock. Okay? And this, again, this is a caricature of what happened at that day. This was the beginning of uh, non-linear risk management. Finance was very linear until options show, showed up. Even leverage is linear, right? You borrow twice as much, you invest twice as much, it's all multiplied by two. But options are non-linear instruments, which is part of what part of the reason that makes them interesting. We'll see this later. Hmm? So your question is actually related to something I'll talk about in, I don't know, maybe three weeks or something like that. How risk management started. And the price of risk. And today, I think today we will we will define the price of risk, at least in this context. But this is these are good questions. I want everybody to understand what we're doing. So I hope this is all very well understood. Is all clear? Yeah. Okay, let me continue. Okay, again, as you as you can see, we're just looking at the landscape from the top of this mountain we just climbed. Okay, so. And this thing that we saw here allows us to define the concept of discounted values. And we see that the option price is really a function of interest rates and not a function of the probability of the stock going up or down. That's settled, all right? Now, let me write another mathematical expression for what we're doing. Um, let me ask you a question. Is there a problem? So let, let's say that we just learned that the probability of 50% is, is useless, okay? We cannot price the option with a probability of 50%. It, it's gonna lead us to think it's, the price is 50 cents, which is too high. Let me ask a question. Is there a probability that happens to price the option correctly? If instead of telling you the probability of my coin flip was 50%, I told you the probability that heads show is 33%, then, without knowing anything about option pricing, maybe you would have guessed that the price of the option is a third. You would have been right for the wrong reason, but you would have been right. You would have calculated the expectation of the option, the expected payoff. You get 33 cents, and you say, well, the answer is 33 cents, and then you would be right, although you did the wrong calculation. The wrong calculation because you use the probability as opposed to using the replicating portfolio, which we now know is the right approach. But that probability that gives you the right answer is very important for us. Okay, and that's what I'm saying here. So let's 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 watch. The option price can still be the expectation of the discounted payoff. I will have to discount if I'm charging. For, for my loan, right? If the loan has non-zero interest rates, I need to discount the value. And it's, so that is, that's the expression with that. So this, of course, this will always be the case because that's the probability that will make my calculation correct. For this example, right? The probability that makes my calculation correct using the incorrect argument is this one. These probabilities are important. Right? Uh, this is an example of an invariant. Uh, an invariants are very important in science and engineering. And this would be it. This is the expectation for an outcome that matches the arbitrage free price. This has a name, it's called the risk neutral, the risk neutral probability, okay? This probability is our first example of what's called a risk neutral probability. Okay, the reason why it's called risk neutral is manifold. One of them is that um, I don't care what the price of risk is, this is the probability that will give you the right price. And according to this risk neutral probability, which by the way will always exist, and that's a theorem, that's the theorem we will prove probably next week. Okay, maybe I start today, we will see. The option price will always be the expectation of the discounted payoff. 
these are dollars that happen in the future i need to discount them to today's dollars obviously otherwise i have the wrong time element into my calculation but once i do that once i discount them to today's dollar the expectation according to this measure this risk neutral measure happens to give me the right option price so that's another human construct another mathematical object we're going to define and it's the one that prices the option correctly with the wrong formula the wrong formula is this we just saw that the price is determined by the replicating portfolio and not by the expectation but if both coincide then that probability will be very important okay and this is what we call an implied probability. It's an implied probability implied by market prices. In our one-third game, the implied probability of the stock going up is 33%. Analysts may have said it's 50% because the stock this, the stock that, whatever. The market is telling me that the probability of my stock going up is 33%. Have you ever seen um, this 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 uh, news usually comes up around the uh, soccer world cup have you ever seen that about six months prior to the soccer world cup some team from usually goldman sachs comes up with the probability that a team brazil or something wins because of what's happening in the market we talked about that well that's how they do it of course it's a bit of a joke because whatever relationship you find in those markets are probably just exercises in data mining they are spurious they probably have nothing to do but you can find measures that relate brazil's performance in soccer to market prices and if you believe that relationship is true then you could find the probability that brazil wins the world cup you see that just need a measure and that measure will give you the probability and you can get the measure by getting your right data set financial markets brazil playing the games and then you see what i mean you can take this very far you can take this as far as even in the realm of comedy and sport predictions mathematically it's the same Okay, let me continue. I hope I hope you're all with me. I hope no one is. I don't have time to look at the chat all the time, but I hope um, this too. So the arbitrage free will be equal to the expected discounted payoff. And when that measure exists, and we will see that it always exists under certain very general conditions, then uh, the price is going to be the expected future value. Okay, and this, uh, this measure, this is actually going to be a process. It's a martingale. I'm not going to say what a martingale is. I'll leave that for if anybody's interested, you can follow up on your own. Okay, so back to the criticism of my course that I showed you my first day in that review and I read it. This is one example of that. I'm not going to get into this. If you want to know what a martingale is and why prices are martingales, there are wonderful books that talk about that. Karatza and Tree, they're all on the website. You can read them on your own. It'll take you months and months and months to develop this theory fully. No point in me developing this in five minutes. I'm not interested. I prefer that you understand the one third game very well, rather than know the theory of martingales and the application in option pricing. If you're going to do a, a thesis on that, a PhD thesis on that, sure, you'll have to spend the next four years of your life learning what all that is, but not in this course. Okay. Great. Um, let me see, look at the time. I think it's a good time to uh, take a break. Uh, no, let me, let me spend a few more minutes and then we take a break. Okay. I'm going to, um, yeah, we're, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, yeah, I, I'm going to give you a few more examples. And when I'm done with the examples, we'll take a break and then I will do the theory when we come back. 
Okay, so here's another example. Here's another example. Imagine I have the call option in the previous example, which is sold for 50 cents. Why? There are some, there are two people that are trading this option for 50 cents. If that's the case, using the formula that I saw earlier, I would get that the rate, the interest rate, should be equal to the solution of the equation, which happens to be about 70%. See, option prices will determine interest rates. There's something interesting here because we saw in lecture number one that bond prices determine interest rates. And now we see that option prices determine interest rates too. Is that a coincidence? No. Something I said, I announced, and it's coming, we're slowly progressing towards it, is that markets are self-consistent. Self-consistent. If rates are equal to a certain thing, then other securities will adapt to that. And that's what happens when interest rates, for example, go up. Typically, company valuations come down, the stock market comes down. Why? Because there's a relationship. And this relationship is what we're slowly converging towards. All these things are related to each other. And it happens to option prices too. So option prices, of course, depend on interest rates. We just saw it earlier. But interest rates depend on op option prices too. That's why it's so hard to manipulate parts of the market because the whole market moves together. Okay? We will see more of this in the examples to come. Let's look at this example here. Imagine that our stock, instead of is still a dollar, but instead of going to two values tomorrow, can go to three values tomorrow. Let's say it can go up to two dollars as before, as to 50 cents as before, but it has a third value, it could stay at a dollar. It's not important what the third value is. How can we price our option with the same strike one as before. You probably have realized by now that pricing the option is equivalent to solving a system linear of equations. That's how you can find the replicating portfolio. How many bonds, how many stocks, you have two events, you have a system of equations with two unknowns and two equations. You can solve it, the answer is two thirds minus one third, that you're done. If you have this, what you're going to find is that we're going to have a system of three equations with two unknowns. What happens when you have a linear system of three equations with two unknowns? Normally, what happens is that you have infinitely, sorry, normally what happens is that you have no solutions or uh, you could have infinitely many solutions. Hmm? Um, in this case, we don't have enough information to determine what the price is under these situations. We have three equations and we have a, a two unknowns. We cannot find uh, the price. There is a, uh, there's, no, there's no way to solve that system of equations. You won't work. This is the situation that we're going to define properly. But staying with this example, these are the situation that correspond to what's called incomplete markets. We don't have enough information. We don't have enough securities with prices given. It can be resolved in two ways. One way to resolve it is by introducing a new security with a price. For example, an option. If I give you an option with a price, then I can price every other option too. But I cannot price an option if that's the only information I have. Another way can be resolved is by introducing time increments before maturity and allowing to trade before maturity. We will see the example of that. Okay. But this is what a this is what an incomplete market is. All of this leads to the concept of pricing theory, which is what we're going to be defining now. So to make sense of all of this, I'm going to go back to the one-third example 
and I'm gonna be I'm gonna rewrite that example differently. I'm not gonna do anything new. I'm not gonna do anything new. I'm gonna do exactly the same thing we did. I'm just gonna write it differently. As follows. First, I'm gonna start with the definition of what's called the payoff matrix right here. This payoff matrix is a, a matrix that contains, let's look at it from a column perspective. I have a column and a column. The first column gives me the possible values of a bond at maturity, at our one period. We're doing a one period finance model here. The bond will always be equal to one dollar, whether the stock goes up or down. It's a bond. It just gives me a dollar. That's why that column is equal to a dollar, the price of the bond at maturity. The stock column is two dollars and fifty cents. These are the possible values of the stock tomorrow. Okay? So in my setup, each security gives me a column and each row gives me the events, the random events that could happen. In this example, there's only the stock going up and down. So there's only two. So two events, the stock going up and down, two random events, and two securities, bond and stock. Okay? Bond, stock, securities by column, and by row is stock goes up, the stock goes down. So probability events, securities. And I can do this with as many events and securities I can have. Hmm? Then the replicating strategy under this is the solution to the system of equations. How many bonds, how many stocks? In the case I have two securities, if I have 100 securities, there will be X1, X2, or X99, X100. How many securities I buy of each of the 100 I have available for trade? And that portfolio, that's a portfolio, right? It tells me a certain number of um, bonds and a certain number of stocks. The payoff matrix times this portfolio is what allows me to define the replicating portfolio as the one that matches the payoff that we're trying to replicate. One zero in our case because our option pays you a dollar if the stock goes up and zero if it goes down. And by the way, solving this is how we find the replicating portfolio. This gives a solution, which you can do with linear algebra, <clears throat> or if you want, you can express my replicated portfolio as X, Y, I call it X with, a, with an arrow, that would be the inverse times the payoff. That's the solution to that. <clears throat> that's the solution to, that's how I can do my replicating portfolio. <clears throat> so the one third, two third, combination I came up with is the solution to this system of equations that you can express in matricial form. If in addition I introduce the cost vector, see the stock is worth a dollar as we said, and now I said in this example that my bond is worth 90 cents, which corresponds to interest rates of approximately 10%, then I can see that the price of my payoff, that payoff will have a price which is that x with a, is with an arrow, is the cost vector times the replicating portfolio. Because the replicating portfolio was the inverse times the payoff, what I have is this expression. The price of my option is going to be given in matricial form as the cost vector times the inverse of the payout matrix times the payoff vector. Now, if this matrix has an inverse, everything is nice. If this matrix does not have an, in, an inverse, then we have an issue. The case of incomplete markets that we saw earlier is when this matrix does not have an inverse. It's not even a square matrix. Then I have an issue. It can be resolved in different ways, but I have to change the market. I have to either ch allow to trade 
intermediately or add more securities to make my matrix invertible. If the matrix is not invertible, the price will not exist. That's the first thing. The second thing is the interpretation of that. Because this matrix expresses in a certain sense the price of time and this cost vector times that expresses some sort of a discounted probability. We will see this in, in, in mathematical formalism later. But what we learn from here is that what we call the risk neutral measure now becomes here a matrix product between a cost vector and the inverse of the payout matrix. Why? Because this, which is a vector, is like a probability measure acting on the payoff vector. So the, this would be an expected discounted payoff. The word discounted is missing, is missing, is missing. It has to be discounted because that's the, what the cost vector does. You see, the interest rates being 90% means that there's a discount factor applied to that. See, we're doing math and we're reading every line financially. That's what we're doing now. That's why this is called mathematical finance. Both math and finance go together. Hmm? Is that clear? Wait, sorry, for the cost vector, is it, wait, why is it uh, 0 0.9 and 1 again? It is the cost vector is whatever is in the market. So this, I, I look at the market. No, no I look at the website. Oh. I see, oh, the stock is worth one dollar and the bond is worth ninety cents, like you are doing in your assignment number one. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, sir. I'm just picking that example. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, yes. And this would correspond to a situation where interest rates are about ten percent. About ten percent. Okay. Now, this is nice because earlier with my 33 cent gain, if I introduce many more stocks, I introduce, who knows, complicated option structures, then how do you find the price? In this case, in one shot, using matrix notation, not only I find the price, I find the replicating portfolio also. And by the way, well, I'm not going to do in this course, I'm not going to do the, 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 uh, the um, dynamic asset pricing theory, which is with, with different time increments. But if I was to do that, then this method would extend to, uh, to um, dynamic asset pricing models where the payoff matrix changes over time where the uh, replicating portfolio changes over time this ma matrix formalism we've developed here will work also if we're going to do things over time we're not i'm going to focus on the single period because the multi-period is just the concatenation of one period models but with a lot of mathematical formalism because i'll have to start to define uh the um the um the process that goes over time, the sigma algebra, well, I'm not interested in that. I prefer that we understand the one period model very well, knowing that the multi-period model is the concatenation of the, of the same theory. But this matricial approach to this is very powerful and make things quite simple. Okay? All right. Now, let me give you another example. It's all about examples now. I was going to take my break after the example, but I had to take it. Uh, Zoom. Actually, my hotel Wi-Fi kicked me out. That's why I had to take it. So imagine the situation where I have a certain stock that over time evolves like this. It's $80 today. It can go up to $120 or $60. From there, from $120, it can go up to $180 or down to $80. From $60, it can go up to $72 or down to $36. Where are these numbers coming from? Well, this is my model. There's no worry about that right now. Hmm? There's no worry about that right now. So if these are the models of my of my stock, I have a certain stock, and then this is an example of a stock that changes over time. I don't have to tell you that you could do this for you know many more than just two days. You can do this for a month, for a week, for a year even. Okay. 
we'll see what happens when we do it for a year. We'll see that later. Then when I do this, then imagine I have a call option with a strength of 75. Okay, and I say interest rates are, are zero. So how can we price this option? How can we price this option? The price this option is as follows. I look at the payoff of my option. Now I have to flip between two slides if I want to explain where these numbers come from. Okay, so let me do that really quickly. I go there. You see, that's the payoff of my option. The strike price is 75. So if I subtract 75 from every one of these payoffs, sorry, all of, all of these payouts, all these prices, if I subtract 75, what I end up with is exactly these numbers that I have here. Okay, you can verify that these are the right numbers. I'm not going to go back to the stock tree. I don't need it for now. Okay, so then I have this. This is the payoff of my option at maturity. I know that. I know that. But how about the value of my option prior to maturity? Forget about today for now. What about the value of my option prior, prior to maturity? Let me go to the easiest node of all. Let's say that I want to find what the price, the price of the option there is. I'm saying it's zero, but it's very clear why it's zero. Why? Because if the stock happens to land at this price, whatever the price is, if the stock happens to land there, what's the price of the option at that node? The option will have a payout of zero if the stock goes up from there and a payout of zero if the stock goes down from there. What's the value of an option that goes up to zero or down to zero? It's zero. That's quite easy. Right? That part was easy. But we perhaps realize in doing this easy calculation is that the price of this branch is independent of what happens to any other branch. This is useful because if I want to find where the value of the option is, if my stock happens to land there, how do I do that? What I do is exactly the same trick. I look at that branch and I price that branch, ignoring what happens in the rest of this tree. I have an option that will give me $105 if the stock goes up. It will give me $5 if the stock goes down. And the stock has a certain price at that note. But that's exactly what we know how to do. We did that earlier. Different numbers, but exactly the same process. It's a very simple option pricing like we did before. So we can do that either with your uh, with your favorite method you can do this finding a replicating portfolio you can do this by finding the risk neutral probability or you can do this with the matrix formalism either works the result is always the same with all three methods which is 45 dollars do you see that sorry do you see that this can be done. I'm not going to go through the solution of the system of equations. So I'm not going to do that. But do you understand that this can be done? This is good because that means that now if the challenge was to find the option price now, I'm not there yet. But I've managed to calculate the option price Tomorrow, for both possible values of my stock. So you know, what I do now is I do, I do the concluding branch, which is I look at that branch only, and I have the same situation as before, which is I have a certain stock at a certain price that can go up or down to some other value. If it goes up, I get $45. If it goes down, I get nothing. I know how to do that. Some of you may 
not understand why I say I get $45. Yeah, I don't get $45. I, the option does not give me money until maturity. I know, but remember that we don't distinguish between getting $45 in cash or getting $45 as an option value or an asset that is worth $45. $45 is $45. We don't care if it's given to us in the form of an option or something else. So this branch is no different from any, this branch is no different from the 33 cent game. So we can set up the system of equations, the matricial expression, portfolio replication, reason interpreter, whatever you like, we can set it up and find that the price of this option is $15 now. Is that clear? We just claimed another mountain, not a very tall mountain, but we just claimed another mountain because now we realize that we can do this for as many time increments as we like. See that? Sorry, I just have a question. Yes. Because I didn't quite know what a call option with strike $75 is, but that just means you take the stock and you subtract $75 at the end? Yeah, so I, um, I don't know if you, you probably didn't join from the beginning. I'm not sure. So this is what a, what a call option is. It's, you can express it in different ways. Uh, you can say uh, you can buy the stock for $75. So if the stock ends up being at 180, the fact that you can buy it at $75 means that that asset is worth $105. If you can buy the stock for $75 when the stock is 80 that means that then the option is worth five dollars if you can buy the stock for 75 dollars when it's worth 72 that means that this option is worth nothing it's not a future you're not obligated to buy it's an option so the value is zero same thing here oh thank you yeah that's one way of looking that's the financial way of looking at it the mathematical way of looking at it is this the option price minus the strike price only when the value is positive. When it's negative, we set it equal to zero. And then it's, then you get the actual numbers. Okay? And that's for this, that's for this payout. But what I'm saying here, or the key to understanding this is that what I have in this branch here, once, once, I find the value of the option at that node and the value of the option at this other node. One, what I have here is another one period option. It's not a call option anymore or some who knows what it is, it doesn't matter, but it, it satisfies the same pattern, which is a stock whose price I know we can jump to two future values, which I know. And under each of those two future values, I know the value or the outcome. It's not given to me in cash. It's given to me as the option itself. But the, the value is, is determined. The value is known. That's why I can use the same method again to find the value of the option at that node. The answer being $15. Okay? And we can do this for as many notes as we like. Is that clear? All right. Now, um, before I go into the formalism what we of what we built here before going to that formalism i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna do the same thing all over again but now i'm gonna introduce some mathematical formalism before i do that let me ask you a question what happens if i do this this is two days right what happens if i do this for one year what happens if i do this for one year
nothing will happen. I do this 365 times, going back daily and doing each branch daily until I find the price today, right? I will do the same. Yes, but the, yes. the, the, the number of, of things you have to calculate is going to grow exponentially, right? And, well, yes, exactly. That, that's where I was going. So this process is called backward propagation. Okay, But the problem I have when I do a year is how many nodes do I have? I have 2 to the power 366, which is how much? A lot. It's about 10 to the power 100. Big. <laughs> too, too big. Uh, I have a question. Yes. One thing that I cannot understand is we were calculating for over the horizon of two days because we would be exercising after two days, right? Yes. The option. Yes. Yes. So why would we calculate for like 360 days in the year when we are not going to exercise it any day? No, 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 no. Yeah, sorry, okay, what I meant is this. So here I have an option, it's issued today, today. And it will be exercised in two days. So two days later, the stock will have a certain price, and then you have the option to exercise. What I'm saying now is, imagine I, I went from one day to two days, right? That's I, it took me an hour to go from one day to two days. That's a big thing. But if I can go from one day to two days, I could continue this. Three hundred and sixty five days. Right? I can do this option for a year. I can do this for ten years. That's all I'm saying. I will have to have a stock price for that, which I don't. I'll go back to my previous uh, here. I need a stock price that continues for three hundred and sixty five days. But in principle, in principle. I can calculate the price of any option that lives for 365 days or any other number of days. That's what I'm saying. Yeah? It is. I get that. That's what I'm saying. I'm trying to extend this from one day to two days to seven days to 30 days to 360 days. So I, I, I want to have 360 days because as Alex was saying, when I do that, I get 302 to the power 366 nodes, which is about 10 to the power 100. Okay, how many terabytes is that? How many terabytes is that? How big a hard drive do I need to store this information? Is it that like more than all the digital information in the world right now? Yes. I mean, you'll need a very big quantum computer for this. So this is not doable. Not doable. Okay. Uh, this is explained in some detail in the book, uh, but we're going to go through this ourselves a little bit later. Uh, what is done, what is done, and uh, this, this will be done properly uh, next week. Uh, what is done is something that looks very innocent, has tremendous impact. Imagine that when I say, when I go up and then down, or down and then up, let's say that I end up in the same node. So these nodes are are just linked. They're the same. I'm doing this in the option one. Let me go back to my previous one. Let's see. I do this at the stock level, okay? Imagine that what I do is every time I go up and then down or down and then up, I said this is the same. So I replace that and that by a single node, by a single node, okay, let's say equal to 76. Mm -hmm. 
What's the impact of that? Up and down, down and up is the same, 76. What's the impact of that? How many nodes do I, do I have now after a year? The number of nodes I have after a year is, someone say it, write it on the chat. I'm really curious to know your ability to come up with this answer. How many nodes do I have after a year? Three hundred and sixty-six. Uh, not exactly. I have three hundred and sixty-five times three hundred and sixty-four divided by two, which is about. It's about the number of days squared divided by two. So I've changed exponential growth by a power growth. Yeah, so Sebastian is right. That number that you wrote there is about the square of 365, right? So I've changed exponential growth by power growth. That's a very big deal. How many terabytes do I need to store this information? How many mega how many terabytes do I need to store this information? Hmm? About one megabyte. That's it. So it's a lot better, isn't it? Which one do you think is used in practice? These these are called non-Markovian trees. The, re the one that is replaced this by 76, these are called recombining. And these are Markovian. I'm not going to do here the theory of Markov processes is one of those things but I, I but here you can understand how the theory of Markov processes is, is very relevant for what we're doing <clears throat> some of you will know what a Markov process is in fact I suspect many of you know what a Markov process is what is a Markov process a Markov pro there's different ways to characterize that let me use one which is a Markov process is one without memory what does that mean that means that if you're here you don't remember how you got here Maybe you went up and then down or down and then up, right? That means that paths are much less than otherwise. The fact that they are much less than otherwise, many less than otherwise, means that actually you can store them in a hard drive. Otherwise, you can't. Very, very hard. Very, very hard. Right? Quantum computers don't care. But computers like we do now, we do because they they work differently. We don't simulate, that's what quantum computers do, they only simulate here. We store information. That's why these things make a very big difference. And that's why recombining trees is what used. Markovian models are the ones that are used in finance. Non-Markovian models are extremely difficult. They may be very accurate, but they are so hard that what's the point? The models you will find in finance are Markovian. And all the ones that we'll be, we'll be dealing with here are Markovian. Well, I just dealt with, this is non-Markovian, but that's the only one we're gonna use. We're not gonna do that again. It's not scalable, okay? So let me, let me have this as the oversimplified, an, an extremely oversimplified coverage of non-Markovian processes. We say goodbye to them. We're not gonna use them here too hard okay okay 
I hope this is understood. I hope it's understood the concept of Markovian, and I hope it's understood how we can price these trees under these scenarios. We can price them in principle in the Markovian or non-Markovian world. We don't care. It's backward propagation. It always works. The problem is that in the non-Markovian world, we cannot go beyond a week because it's too hard. It's too many numbers, right? Okay, let me leave that there. Um, so let me now uh, just go there. Let me, this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to take everything we have learned today, everything, and one more time, I want to wrap it up into mathematical formalism. That's what I'm going to do. Mathematical formalism of everything we did today. Today's class is very steep climb. Okay, I am aware of that. We learned how to deal with randomness. We learned, we were surprised to see that randomness is actually not random <laughs> when it comes to finance. A lot of the randomness is not random. And now, then we saw the matricial expression and okay. Then we said the Markovian versus non Markovian. And now I'm going to go and create a formalism for this so that we can create a mathematical theory that deals with all of this. And then I'll stop. I'm going to be about 10 centimeters from the finish line. What will be left to do today is what's called the fundamental theorem of asset pricing, which is climax of everything we have seen so far. It explains why the yield curve exists. It explains why expected discounted probabilities exists. It explains why replicating portfolio. It explains everything we have seen so far. And it's a theorem. It's the one theorem I told you I was going to do in this course. Only one. And the reason is that it's the theory of everything when it comes to pricing. I'm not going to do that today because it was a very steep climb and that last bit is the steepest of the claims. We're going to leave that for next week. That's how I will start class next week. So what I want to do now is I want to stay at the top of the mountain we're at and I'm just going to look at the next peak we'll have to climb next week. That's all we're going to do. That's all we're going to do. Okay, We're just going to stare at the next peak we will climb to convince ourselves that it's worth going there. There's a lot to gain by going to that last peak. And from there, we see everything. We see everything. In the finite period model. After that, we'll have to develop the, you know, the continuous time finance and then things become very different, very nice. But at this stage we're at, once we climb the fundamental theorem of asset pricing peak, we will see the yield curve, we will see derivative pricing, we will see lots of things, all of them, all of them summarized into a, into a very simple, very concise theory. <clears throat> what I'm about to do now is I'm going to start developing some mathematical description of the objects we're going to be dealing with. This could be, I want to go very slowly, make sure I don't lose anybody, okay? This could be very dry. Now, to make it a little bit less dry, I want to give you some historical context for why this is very important. And the historical context, I have to go back to the 80s, 1980s. Okay. Um, tell a bit of a story. The 1980s were very interesting times for mathematical finance. I should tell you, I did my PhD at Princeton in 1985. That's when I started, I ended in 89. So I lived through this myself. I was a mathematician, I didn't go into finance until much, much, much later, only when I came to Toronto in 1992. Um, but back then what was happening is, uh, these theories that you're seeing here had just been discovered. They had been around for approximately 10 years only, and they were very advanced. I mean, is what, we're, what we've seen before and more, okay? They were so advanced that the banks 
had no employees that understood any of what we're talking about. Although the theories existed, okay? But then suddenly what happened is places like Princeton, where I was at, Princeton, the, the thing to do in the 80s at Princeton, the PhD to do was in, in physics, in solid state physics, particle physics. That's when quarks came up and, you know, uh, the particles were being invented every day and it was, was fantastic. And many, many people went in to do a PhD in physics to the point that there were more physics PhDs than there were jobs for physics PhDs. So where do you think these physics PhDs got their jobs? Wall Street. They ended up going to Wall Street, right? Uh, banks were always willing to hire, you know, the smart graduates from Princeton, MIT, Harvard. They just hired them. Then they went there and said, well, uh, you, there are no quarks here. We have money, so you better learn what we're doing. And they did that. And I'm going to give you a bit of a caricature of what happened during those years. It was very interesting. And we can understand the caricature now. People who haven't seen what we just saw today may not understand the caricature, but you will understand the caricature. So imagine that you go there equipped with your knowledge of, of, of math. And these, all these particle physicists had very, very good math at their disposal. And then you go into a market that I'll use this caricature. You go into a market where you see that the option prices for the 33 cent game, you know, people are paying 50 cents for them, like you did at the beginning of class today. And then you do a bit of reading and you, you learn everything that we learned today it wasn't so hard, right? And then you learn that the, that option that people pay 50 cents for is actually worth 33. What do you do? You sell them for 40 cents to get more people to buy yours. Say that again. When you sell them at 40 cents, so people buy more of yours than exactly. other people's. Exactly. And when you sell them at 40 cents, what happens? You're going to make five cents every time you trade. Right? So you're going to sell a lot of them. And you know that every time you sell one, you're going to make a profit. So what happens? You make huge amounts of money for your bank. It's a caricature, but it's a very, very accurate description of what was happening. So then there were these people. They were not economists. Many people in the bank were economists at the time. They were not economists. They were particle physicists. And they were making a killing. Their PNL was growing and growing and growing and growing. So these things became a little bit like a, a myth of some sort, right? Because no one understood what they did. They understood these theories that we're seeing here today, but no one understood what they did. Mathematical finance in the 80s was called particle economics. because a lot of these people were particle physicists that just ended up with a job at Wall Street. They understood the theories we saw today, they understood the theories we will see next week and the week after, and the week after that. They understood all of that. It's not so hard. We're going to see some differential equations, and they understood that. Differential equations, my God, they, they did things far more complicated than differential equations. There was nothing for them, you know? So they started to see that uh, a lot of these instruments were mispriced, so they could price them right, they could catch them correctly, and they could end up making a lot of money for the banks. And that was, in a certain sense, how mathematical finance first made it into the financial sector, not as mathematics, but as particle economics. That's how they call it. Understand? So, to be in that position, I mean, it takes you know, them a few years to learn to trade and then to take advantage of this. Uh, we're going to, it's not going to take us so long. It'll take us, you know, six hours, three hours today and three hours next week. And I think we'll be at that level, maybe a little bit more, maybe, maybe 12 hours altogether. That's it. Okay. But we're going to be there. 
we're going to be there. But to do that, we have to continue our climb into this mountain that we just started to climb today. Okay. So that's the price of the game we're going to be playing. If we play it right, we will we will be in that position. Of course, you know, forget about, um, you know, we, you cannot roll the clock back to the 80s. Now, as you know, the world of finance is full of people that know all of these theories and more. So you cannot just go there and make money for free like they were doing. However, what's happening to uh, what happened to finance in the 80s is happening to other fringe areas of finance these days. And this is what a lot of the uh, artificial intelligence and data science is doing in finance and in other areas. So a lot of that analogy continues to exist. You just need to be good enough at it and then end up in the right place at the right time. Okay, so um, those times are not completely gone. They just evolved into different situations. So a lot of that will, will continue to be there. But coming back to finance, and given that we're still dealing with the beginnings of our development of derivative pricing, I need to set up a certain mathematical structure, mathematical environment on which we can formulate and solve the fundamental theorem of asset pricing from where we will see a, a wonderful landscape that helps us understand everything, everything around finance. Okay, so let's get started. The first thing that I need to do, I need to start making definitions of the entities that were created today. We work with stocks, we work with bonds, we work with derivatives. I introduce the price of a derivative, I introduce a payoff matrix, I introduce the cost factor. I need to define all of that now. That's what I'm going to do. So now we're going to see definitions. Nothing new, no new concepts for now. In fact, I don't think I'm going to see anything new. I have about just over half an hour of lecture time. Nothing new in the next half hour. Okay? Just restatements, definitions of things that we have seen. Definitions that will be very convenient because they will put us in a position at the beginning of next week to do the fundamental theorem of asset prices, making two pictures and coming up with you know two or three theorems. And then that will be the end of it. But we need to do a little bit of preparation. We need to develop the abstract environment on which everything we develop today lives. Let's get started. I'm going to be assuming that I have a probability space with payoffs of N securities available for trade. That's how we started. I said I have a stock that goes up and down. And I said with a certain probability, 50%. We saw that the probability was not that relevant. It doesn't matter, but there was one. And as you will see, it's very important that there is a probability with certain characteristics. Okay, so we need to get to the bottom of this. Um, and payoffs, the payoff is what we defined. It was $2.50. The future value, we'll call it a payoff. Mm -hmm. And we say that there are n of them. By the way, this number n could be infinity. For those of you, uh, and there are many of you who know about uh, Hilbert spaces and Banach spaces, um, everything I'm doing here could be generalized to a Banach and Hilbert space framework in which I can deal with infinitely many securities, no problem. I'm not going to do that. For those of you who don't, I'm going to stay in the realm of finitely many securities. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I will try to express everything I do so that if you do know about Gilbert and Banach spaces, you can take that dimension to infinity and everything will work. So that's where we are. N security for trade, possibly infinite. Now, each security is characterized by its cost now, or its price, the value that it has now, and its payoff after one unit of time. So we're doing single period finance. Could be a day, could be a year, a week, okay, one, one period. The cost of each security is given by a certain number we call Q. So it gives us a vector. And the payoff is given by a random variable, a random vector if you want to. If I have finitely many events and finitely many securities, this would be a matrix. If I, in any case, it will always be a random vector, maybe of dimension infinity. 
Hmm? We saw an example of a matrix, a payoff matrix earlier was this. So that's what we're doing. Nothing new, I told you, there's nothing new coming up here. Everything I'm defining, we've already seen. The expected payoff is the expectation of each of those column vectors that we had. We put them into columns, right? So the expectation is going to be that. We already know that the expectation will not be the price. Because there's no way of ensuring that the probability is the right one. We saw that there was one probability that worked, at least in our simple example. We will see that this is always going to be the case. Always. But for that, we need to have the right probability. We will have the probability given to us, like the 50%. This expected security will not be the price. It will be something else. So prices will not be expectations. Only when you have the right measure. We know that and it's going to come up in this abstract concept. Again, nothing new. A portfolio for us is, we're going to define it as a vector finite if I have finitely many securities or infinite if I have infinitely many securities and it represents the number of holdings in each of the securities that we have each component could be positive negative or zero if it's positive we say we are along the security if it's negative we say we are short the security okay the payoff of the portfolio is going to be the dot product of my portfolio vector times my payout matrix. Now, for those of you who know infinite dimensions, what this will be here is this is an, this, an, an inner product in a Hilbert space of my Hilbert element, which is my portfolio vector, and my matrix, which is going to be a map between events into payouts. And payoffs will not be vectors anymore. Well, they will be vectors, but they will be vectors in a Hilbert space. Okay? For those of you who know infinite dimensions. We're going to do everything in finite dimensions. So if you don't know that, if you don't know infinite dimensions, you don't have to worry. This is the dot product as you saw in basic algebra many years ago. Um, we saw that markets were complete when um, we had a, a square matrix that we could always think that in our situation, in our context, we're going to define that a little bit more generally by saying that a market will be complete if the, okay, this question, DW is a matrix. This is a matrix. I, I remember, remember this. That's the matrix. That's the bond column. These are the events column. The events here is stock up, stock down. The bond always one, stock two, a half. Okay? Okay, so it, D is not the vector with elements DI. That's, that's the, maybe the connotation is confusing. Okay, so DI is that. So that's D1 and that's D2. If I remove the subindex, then I have the matrix. Ah, uh, HDI is a vector. Okay, yes. Okay, I understand. Yeah, so here I is the security, which for this is each column. Yeah? I understand. Yes. <clears throat> yes, yes, yes. Good. Good, good, good. All right, so now I say the market is complete. If the span of all of these payoffs that arise from the securities I know gives me all of the payoffs that I have. Now, all of the payoffs is uh, they're going to be an L2 of a certain measure. For us, if you don't know what this means, still we just um, the space of all possible payoffs that we have, which is R to the power uh, N. Okay. So let me explain what this means in the example that we saw. If I have a stock, remember we had a stock that could go to $2, $1, or $0.50. Cents. 
that was the stock. I said, this market is incomplete. Why? Because I have this and I have a bond with payoff 111. The linear span of this does not contain every possible payoff. In fact, the payoff 100 is not in the span. In this case, the payoff 100 is not in the span of these two vectors that I have here. You see? That's why the market is incomplete. I need more securities with prices I know before this market will be complete. And completing the market means I need to increase the number of securities with cost there. So the concept of completion or market completion is a is a concept of linear span is how you construct bases for linear linear spaces okay so if you know linear algebra all of this will be very easy for you we're going to assume markets are complete uh, if they're not complete then um the theories that we'll see here will not work. We'll typically have infinitely, infinite, infinitely many prices or even no prices. Okay? But there will, there will be a theorem. Our theorems will work in the case of complete markets. Why? Because in complete markets, it's, we're essentially doing linear algebra. And there we know that solutions exist to systems of equations. If my matrix is either... Um, um, under or over determined, then either I have no solutions or infinitely many solutions. Okay, that's why. So, so far, so good. Everything we saw before is now written in this very heavy math jargon that you have here in front of me. But there's no complication, everything we have seen. Okay? Everything we have seen. Checking the chat as I'm lecturing. Make sure that I answer every question. I don't want to lose anybody here. Oh, I think Sebast that was Sebastian's question that I already answered, I think. Okay. Great. We continue. Just taking the time. I'm doing good. Now, the cost of a portfolio is the dot product between the cost vector and the portfolio. It's the dot product. Okay. In the case of infinite dimensions, it's going to be the L2 product. Okay. And then the return of a portfolio is its payoff divided by the cost. Right? It's how much you make divided by how much you invested. So that's that. For every portfolio, the return is going to be a random variable that indicates randomness. Equal to that. Of course, this will have expectations, they will have a standard deviations. It's a random variable. The return is a random variable that can be calculated under each of the scenarios in our event space. Nothing new. Still nothing new. Definition of arbitrage opportunity. We already saw that. Here's the definition, finally. And now I can write the definition in very clear form because I've defined all the formalism for it. Okay? An arbitrage opportunity is a portfolio with the following characteristics. The cost is not positive, and the payoff as a vector is not negative almost everywhere with the probability that is positive not zero okay I've defined arbitrage so this is important someone asked earlier for what that was that back to our 33 cent game, if I buy an option and I pay too little for it or too much for it, meaning that over time I end up 
I mean, I know it's, a, it's the arbitrage free price, right? It can be replicated, but if I end up making more money than I should have, then you say, well, that would be arbitrage. And the answer is no. No, it will be arbitrage when I make money for sure. If the odds are in my favor, it's not arbitrage. Arbitrage is when I make money for sure, as expressed by this definition here. Okay. Okay, now the efficient market hypothesis, which, which was mentioned already last week in passing and with verbosity, not with math, now I can define. It states that there is no arbitrage, so por this portfolio does not exist. There are no portfolios like this, and there are no transaction costs. This is important. It just means that the price is unique. Whether you buy or sell, the price is the same. If there are transaction costs, then you need to distinguish two prices. Buy, sell, bid, ask. Some of you had that issue with when you were looking at assignment number one and getting bond prices. There was a bid and the ask. In our assumption here, under the assumption of no arbitrage, it's the same. Only one price. Each security has only one price. And that's fundamental because what the theorem of asset pricing will say is that if securities have a single price, everything has a single price. And we always know what it is. Okay? Okay, I continue. These are just definitions. There's very little to understand here and everything has already come up. I'm just writing the definition of it. Now, here's a theorem. This is the fundamental theorem of asset pricing. Hmm? which I will prove next week. And again, we're doing this very steep climb. I just want to look at it. We're looking at it, you know, like when you're doing climbing, you just look at, oh my God, I have to go up to that mountain, really? That's all we're doing. We will climb the mountain next week, okay? And there's different ways of expressing that. I, for some reason, I have here a very mathematical way to express it, um, not to scare you, but perhaps to show you the full force of what this can do for us. And, <clears throat> It says the following, you have linear functionals of the payoffs, which is the price. The price is really what a linear functional of the payoff is going to be. The payoff is going to be a vector, and the linear functional of a vector could be anything. And the price is a linear functional. Why? Because the price of two derivatives, or sorry, the price of two securities is the price of one plus the price of the other. It's a linear function. Okay. In math, we call them functionals which allows us to take this to infinite dimension to infinitely many securities. And if that's the case, then there is, exists a random variable. There's a random variable that will help us price. This is the price. Will help us price as the expected discounted payoff. That's the payoff. And that's the expectation. And that is going to be the discount. That's going to be the discount. This we will see next week. But look, this is interesting. It says, if markets are complete, this variable is unique. And moreover, it says, if there are no arbitrage opportunities, this random variable is strictly positive. This is interesting because if I have a computer that co calculates this um, random variable, then if I see that any entry is negative, then I know this is an arbitrage opportunity, which means I can make money for free, so I better get to work. This is a detector of arbitrage opportunities. When you have a complicated market, arbitrage opportunities, who knows? I mean, they could exist, you just don't know what they are. Well, this is a detector of that. And by the way, there is an algorithmic way of finding what those arbitrage opportunities will be. Because we're essentially finding a portfolio with a that that has a, um, a positive uh, payoff. It's, it's finding a certain vector in a certain linear space. And we will see the algorithm for that. We will see that when we prove the theorem. The reason I like to prove the theorem is that the proof of the theorem gives you the algorithm to find all of these things. Okay. 
Are we together? Okay. So this random variable will be called the state price deflator because that's what it does. It deflates prices into uh, into today. Okay, we'll see that next next week. Um, it's one way to see that is if I calculate the expectation of the return of a portfolio times that, that number is always going to be one. Okay, it's just it's it's a tautology. If you put the definition of return, which I have a few slides ago, you multiply by this, the expectation is one. What does that mean? That means that the return of a portfolio could be high or low. This is what makes this be equal to one. It has that deflation characteristic that makes the expected return multiplied by it equal to zero. Sorry, equal to one. The expectation is equal to one. Now, in, in, in applications, we're always going to assume that there's a special security. We call it D0, 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 which is constant for all um, events that could happen. This is our bond. In the case of continuous time finance, it's not really a bond because it's a bond that has the same value over and over and over. And this is, I mean, as you know, bonds can go up and down in price. That's what you're doing as I mean, number one. Because of that, this is also sometimes called the savings account. The name savings account comes from dynamic asset pricing theories. For single period theories, it could be a savings account, it could be a bond, it doesn't matter. But if you're doing this dynamically, the bond doesn't quite work. You need a savings account or a bond with constant interest rates, which is not really a bond. Okay, so that will be called the savings account. It's the, it's the deterministic security that we have in our portfolio. And there's only one deterministic security, there cannot be two. Because by absence of arbitrage, if there are two, they really will be the same. Okay, what what um, absence of interest does is it, it, it will help us price risk. And this is the riskless security. It's only one. There's only one riskless security. And the price of that is interest rates because there's going to be no risk premium to a riskless security. All right. And we can do another calculation, which is that the expectation of the savings account or the bond is the inverse of the expectation of the state price deflator and that is by definition that comes from there nothing new just mathematical definitions of things that we already saw today things that we already know okay and to end the riskless interest rate is one over this is we already saw that in this context is uh, the restatement of the definition of yield that we saw last week is one over time to expiration or in our case this the time of our single period model the logarithm of the expectation of the return of the savings account security of the bond security it's exactly the same thing as yield that we defined two weeks ago. Okay, so this is just the def this is just definition. We haven't done anything new, really here. Okay, and this is the theorem, which is that the price deflator um, exists if and only if there is a no arbitrage. And as we, we saw earlier, the, um, the state price inflator being a uh, positive um, indicates that there's no arbitrage. It's, it's going to be, uh, we will see a construction which is, is geometric. Uh, it's not going to lead itself automatically to an algorithm, but the steps that we will do could be turned into an algorithm in the case of finite dimensions. In infinite dimensions, no. In fact, in infinite dimensions, we're going to have to use um, the 
we're going to use the, the Hambana theorem in infinite dimensions that, as some of you know, is equivalent to the axiom of choice. So in infinite dimensions, this cannot be turned into an algorithm. Cannot. But in finite dimensions, yes. Okay? We'll have to use some geometry for that. Okay, so um, this is it. This is the proof. Um, I will do the proof next week. The proof is really two pages. It's that, just that, okay? Uh, but it's the climax of everything we've done today. Um, I don't want to do the proof now. I really want to do it at the beginning of next week when you're more fresh. Okay, today was was a lot of information today. I know that, okay? And I don't want that to be... Um, I, I prefer that we have the ability, that we have maybe half an hour next week to devote our attention fully to the only one proof I'm going to do in this in this course, which is the one that says that it's basically the theorem of the existence and uniqueness of a crisis in financial markets. It's the one that will say why the yield curve exists, why um, risk neutral probabilities exist, why derivatives have a unique price. 